Uh, so I want to get into all of your albums uh, in a minute, but let's talk about you as a songwriter. First, I would like to talk about uh, some of your influences. Now, I know for a fact from listening to you years ago you know, that you were a big Chris Christopherson fan. In fact, I didn't even know he was a songwriter until I listened to you. Um, and then I went because of you and I listened to all of his albums just to find out what the fuss was about. Um, I think mm -hmm. he's, he's a big deal for you, isn't he? Absolutely has been all my life actually so you know imagine yourself when you're a toddler and one of the main records being played in the house is his first record and so there's this almost uh rest the spoken word thing happening with verses on certain songs and then singing the melody and you know he's not the He's not the greatest singer in the world, doesn't claim to be, uh, but he communicates in a way that sells the, the words of the song and that you really feel it. Some of the best songwriters in the world are like that. But um, so I grew up loving him and wanting to be just like him. Um, and we saw, you know, A Star is Born when it came out, and I just loved that. And unfortunately, we saw Convoy as well which wasn't as good but uh yeah so uh yeah chris was uh, always a big influence and still is um but those first couple of records are are kind of the ones that i always go back to because they take me back to my childhood you know and um i've gotten to know him over the years uh, especially uh, there have been a few times we were able to get together and play music together which was amazing you know yeah, he was, he's a cool guy, you know, he's, it's, it's great when you're not, uh, you know, you always hear about, you know, meeting your heroes can be a disappointment, and I'm, I'm happy to say it wasn't with him, you know, it was really great, you know, it's, a, it's like having an uncle or a second dad or something. That's great. Uh, there's yeah. a song you covered by him, uh, this is, is, is it just called Sunday Morning, or is it called Sunday Morning Going Down? What's it? Sunday morning coming down. Sunday yeah. morning coming down. I, you know, I'd heard the song a number of times, but as I listened to your performance, uh, something kind of startled me. Uh, the lines kind of go, you know, uh, I drank a beer for breakfast. It was so good. I had another one for dessert. I went into the closet and picked out my least, the, the you know, cleanest dirty shirt. Mm -hmm. And as I'm listening, I'm like, this is going to maybe sound funny to you, but I was like, oh my God, those lines all rhyme. <laughs> you know, yeah. I got so caught up in the story he was telling that the fact that there was a rhyme going on escaped me for a lot of songs you hear the rhymes but with his song didn't hear it it's incredible and uh, he didn't always rhyme perfect rhymes but he did in that song quite a bit um but the way he would do it he's the story is the thing that sucks you in mm -hmm. and then you yeah you either figure out that it rhymes later or you don't or because the the rhyming is alongside the melody uh it just becomes unnoticeable at times and and in his version really you know you really get that out of it and i appreciate you saying uh, that about my version but yeah his is um this is something because again, he's, he's not overdoing it. And, and I think he was really in a serious, uh, um, uh, desperate place when he wrote that. Uh, he was a janitor at the time working in, uh, Nashville at Columbia record studios and, uh, trying to give tapes to people like Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and none of them were listening to him yet. And, and, uh, and you know he was poor and he had gotten divorced and his parents had disowned him and uh they wanted him to be at least a senator or something because it's because <laughs> it's you know he'd gone to he'd gone to he was a Rhodes scholar he's gone to oxford um he was a great student um he had uh, been offered a job teaching at west point he turned that down i think he may have taught for a little bit, but anyway, I mean, he ends up leaving all of that kind of possible political future, you know, uh, 
where there was money involved in politics and he could have done great at that too. I'm sure he's brilliant man. But he, he followed his bliss, you know, he did the Joseph Campbell thing and he, and he followed his bliss. And, and uh, sometimes as you're following your bliss, though, you, you, you're in some, some valleys, which I've, I've uh, definitely come across myself. But yeah, I think songs like that really sum it up of what he's all about. And um, there's a story where Johnny Cash wants, um, wants to do that song on his TV show that he had in like the early 70s. And the network doesn't want Johnny to say stoned on, on network television. And of course that's, you know, back then especially that would have been a problem because it was probably not a year or two before that Jim Morrison uh, defied the network uh, and said hi. And, and uh, so it was, a, it was a problem. And so Johnny called Chris and said, hey, the network's fine with me doing the song, but they want me to change that line. And I was, I've been beating my head about it, trying to figure out what I could replace the line with. And I thought maybe, um, uh, I could I could replace it maybe with uh, wishing Lord that I was home instead of wishing Lord that I was stoned. And uh, and Chris said, "Well, Johnny, that's just not the same level of desperation now, is it?" And so Cash ended up doing it the original way. Oh wow! He actually looked right at the camera when he said it, and. Uh, I don't know how much longer his TV show was on after that, but uh, yeah, it was, it's that kind of honesty in those guys that I really have always loved, you know, it's, okay. it take, yeah, it's guts and it's a lot of guts and, 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 and keeping things real. <laughs> Cash also a, a hero for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've gotten more into it. Uh, the older I get, I've gotten more and more into it. But yeah, we had some Johnny Cash records around when I was a kid that I loved. Um, the Shel Silverstein song, A Boy Named Sue, was always a favorite of mine. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I love I love him. I love, I love Silverstein. Silverstein. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love him as a songwriter. He's a great songwriter. Again, I, I was introduced to him as a children's writer. And of course, discovering the full Shel Silverstein man is quite a shock when you come to it <laughs> yeah it's crazy and he he had that he put out that record called a light in the attic and it, it, mostly it's all songs and poems and it's so good because it's his voice so you hear yeah. his voice you know and which is really unusual he's got a really unusual voice had an unusual voice so lived on a pirate ship down in key west i think the last 20 or 30 years of his life mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I met uh, Bobby Bear Jr. And uh, Bobby Bear Jr. told me about, you know, Shel Silverstein coming around their house when he was a kid. And, you know, uh, but, plenty of crazy stories. Oh, yeah. 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 Those were crazy times. Any other artists that you want to mention, maybe women as well, who've inspired you that you'd like to, sh to share? Oh, yeah. I mean, the obvious songwriter types, um, you know, Joni Mitchell in my 20s was huge for me. Still, I love Joni Mitchell. Uh, Sean Colvin, Ani DeFranco. Um, you know, I'm a really big uh, Gladys Knight fan. Mm -hmm. uh, her being from this area where, where I live is pretty cool. I always get pride in that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, I like all that stuff, Ray Charles, uh, anybody that can deliver a song really well. Um, I'm trying to think of other people. You know how it is when someone asks you. Uh, okay. But, but you me. No, the obvious, the obvious singer songwriters, you know, and, um, but I love all good music. I mean, you know, uh, I love, I love some heavy metal and really, really hard rock. Um, you know, I love uh, certain bluegrass stuff. You know, I'm what I'm get picky about is if they're 
like in bluegrass, for instance, if the picking's great, but the songs aren't any good, it kind of goes over. It just kind of, I'm like, ah, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> I, I like some of the more traditional bluegrass that had really solid lyric and melody. Um, but there's still great stuff out there today, no doubt about it. You know, I, I love Chris Thiele, whatever he's doing, uh, I dig. Um, yeah, yeah, I like a, a lot of stuff. Queens, one of my favorite bands of all time. I love Prince. I got to see both of them in concert when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. So as a songwriter, um, you know, everybody's songwriting approach is different and you may not write songs the way your heroes did. How do you write them? Well, I don't write them right now very much at all. I've not, I've not written anything. And um, the last thing I wrote was with my wife and, and I love it. It's called Old Man Worry. And I, and she wrote the lyric as a poem. And then I, I put some music to it and it was effortless. I didn't have to, didn't have to really try it just because the lyric was so good. It was easy to do. Um, I wrote one called The Light with Levi Lowry before that. And uh, we worked on a couple other things, but didn't finish them uh, a couple of summers ago. But I haven't written a lot. Um, I don't know what that's about. I mean, sometimes I go through periods of time like that. You know, since I left any kind of label system, there's no pressure to do it. And then the fact that people get their music free and they, you can't really sell a, a whole album more than a few thousand copies. It doesn't give me a lot of motivation to to make a whole album of songs unless I feel like doing it, which I guess I haven't. So what I've enjoyed doing is going out and playing live, uh, especially lately, you can get, really get out there again. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm thinking it'll come back, you know, surely, but um, I'm always kind of in the back of my head thinking, you know, you really ought to try to write, but that hasn't ever worked for me when I tried to, uh, you know, force it. I usually really needed to be uh, hit with the muse of some, you know, and it has to be, it usually has to be kind of in a tough time. You know, like I have to be going, it can't really be in when, it, when I'm in the middle emotionally. It, it's either got to be at a real, and the highs don't work either, like when you're really, really happy. And I remember hearing Joni Mitchell talk about that when when she's really doing great and, ha and, and having a really solid, happy time that that's the last time you want to write songs because you're too busy being happy. <laughs> and that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, right. So when I've, I think when I've used songs or songwriting as a, I've used it as an escape from pain throughout my life. And so, you know, I guess that's a good sign right now that I don't have a lot of that. But the, the downside of that is that I'm not very productive with writing. So but something how, pushes you. Yeah. Yeah. But how I write has changed a lot. You know, I used to, when I first started, I would try to cram words into the melody and chord progression. The chords would come first, then a melody, and then words after that. And that's that's the opposite now. Like when I do write, it's words first. Wow. Do you find, uh, I mean, I've tried to write songs both ways too, and it is interesting how different the songs come out when you switch that around. What's your take on that? I just think that the lyric is, I mean, for the kind of thing I do or want to do anyway, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's more important, but it's certainly harder mm -hmm. to write a really solid, good lyric um, than for me, than it is to come up with a good melody. Like I, the melodies tend to be, uh, and, and the more songwriters that are really good that I talk to, they say, yeah, that's how it is for everybody. They say, you know, we've heard all of these things that are melodies our whole lives, and we're only working with 12 notes, right? 
And so there are these different kind of variations on the same 12 notes or not even, right? Not even 12 notes. Same in the key, yeah. And, and then you're dealing with a very limited uh, number of chord progressions that really work for what we call pop or popular music, things that a lot of people might enjoy listening to. Um, and so I think that, you know, getting the lyrics solid and it might take a bunch of different versions before it's there, you know, like I won't say that I go anywhere near the level of Leonard Cohen when you're, when he was writing a song like Democracy and it was like 60 verses or something. And I don't do that, but I might take those four verses and the, and, and the choruses and the bridge or whatever and really, do I need this pronoun here? Do I need, you know, does that even need to be there? And I really study that stuff. I start getting into the, the little kind of micro way of looking at it. And without, you know, you also don't want to overdo it. And, and uh, but the better songwriters that I have been able to co-write with, a lot of them are like that. And so um, I take their advice on that and, and it's probably been maybe 10 or 12 years that I've worked more that way. But like I said, I'm not doing much of anything these days, right? but maybe I'll get back to that. Well, there's two aspects to your song and your songs in particular that I'd like to uh, bring up and ask you about. Um, and the first is uh, this, I've just noticed over the years, there's this tension between I want to express myself versus I want to write something that people will find entertaining. There's a push pull there that I've found kind of comes and goes throughout your work. Are you mm. conscious of that? It's really an interesting thing to point out. Um, yeah, I think I am conscious of that. I mean, it's not really something that I like. I mean, I wish I was more the way you really, I think I would want to be was, I don't care what anybody uh, thinks, you know, this is how I want to do it. But because, because you think the heroes are kind of like that, you know, like Bob Dylan or Johnny Mitchell, those kind of people are, are probably, you would think they are like that. Maybe they're not, but um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a, 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 a tension or a, or a kind of, this going with with those two ideas um but i think some of the worst stuff i've ever written was because i didn't have enough of that one part in it where i was being true to what i thought was the best thing to do you know and i think that's the that's the trick is to have the balance because it is entertainment and at the end of the day you want to be able to entertain or no one's going to show up or listen, but you also want to be true to what you want to do and, uh, and what you think is the, what you can do, what you can really honestly offer. Um, the other, here's another idea is that if you, if you can sing pretty well, or if you can play an instrument really well or whatever it is, you may be able to do a lot of different things, a lot of different styles. Like Laurie White, who's since passed away since she produced my record, she was like that. I mean, she was on Broadway. She was, she could sing anything and produce anything and play really well on a lot of different instruments. So that can almost hurt you in a way. Um, not in her situation, but I, I remember after Soul's Core, the next record I did, I wanted to try something really different. And and uh and it didn't work as well you know because i didn't stick to the same little you know thing and and i was bored with that and and uh wanted to try something else i was just writing in a certain way and and uh and the label was not happy with that and kind of had me go in and and work toward more of a pop sound to, to kind of keep me on the radio and all of my real fans didn't like that sound, you know, I think. 
or at least the people that had seen lullaby video and heard that on the radio, this other thing uh, was more, it was more pop and, uh, and, uh, and that was a co-write, you know, that, uh, that one of the people in it ended up suing me over, which was funny, but, um, it's one of those things you have to learn early on if you can, because I've made enough mistakes that you have to stick to what your real, your real thing is, whatever that is, keep, you know, keep fighting for that. And, uh, because in the music industry, that's exactly what it is. It's an industry. And uh, so if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to get a deal or whatever kind of deal it is, you know, or um, there's going to be all this stuff that comes with it that may not align with what's true to you. you know, I admire people that, that kind of go against that grain, you know, but they usually, it, it makes it hard on them too, though, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. but um but yeah, it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy business that way. The other aspect of your songwriting that I've noticed, uh, this is it's gonna I may not be able to express it exactly, but uh, in some of your most interesting music, there's a kind of wry humor slash anger slash preach quality, um, and I can give two examples of this. Um, one is actually not a song you wrote, uh, but it's a song I heard. Uh, it's by the great Andy Offit Irwin, the uh, storyteller, and he wrote a song called Clarice, which I heard first before I heard it from you. I actually heard his version, and it was hilarious. It's this strange song about a man that falls in love with a woman in the in the clan. And when yeah. I heard him do it, I just laughed out loud. It's the funniest, goofiest song. And then I heard you do it live, and it scared me to death. It was not funny at all. It was like, oh God, he's seriously telling this woman to quit the clan. So it was like you took that song dead serious. Um, and so there's another uh, example too, but you want to talk it. about that? Well, I think there's a couple of things that might have been the reason that would have been is that Andy, Andy is just a genius. And whenever the songwriter is performing the song they wrote, they get the full, he's a comedian too. I mean, the guy's hilarious. And he never even if his even if his lyric has anger in it you never get that um because of the way he communicates it yeah it's just the way he is he's just funny mm -hmm. so i think when i was doing that song back in the day um uh, we were just doing kind of more of a rock soul version i was singing it louder and harder uh I probably wasn't making funny faces. He probably, I think from what I remember, used to make kind of, you know, almost those James Taylor-esque funny faces. And he's just a brilliant artist. I've always loved him. Um, uh, so I think that's part of it. And, uh, and the other part of it is that when I was doing that song, I was really wanting to get that that subject out there, you know, like, at that time, though, it hadn't been that many years before that I had been, you know, beaten up pretty good by a bunch of skinheads hmm. in Little Five Points, you know, and it was about 1986. Me and a guy that was in my band, you know, we got jumped and, and, and you know, so, you know, that stuff, that, that stuff will make you angry. But hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's that's some of that, that's a song I haven't done in so long, early career kind of stuff when I look back on it. Um, but to, an to answer your question or to comment on the question, I think you're hitting the nail on the head with me because there is a there is a little anger still, whatever that I don't know why kind of always been that way, a little sense of humor still storytelling. Um, I think the older I get, the less of the negatives I, I feel, um, which is hopeful, you know, to me. But, uh, you know, I mean, I was, you know, to, today I'm, I'm, I'm looking for an IRA that I can't find. 
you know, that was that I did, you know, probably 15, 16 years ago. And I don't know what company I did it with. <laughs> you know, that'll piss you off, you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> so well. yeah, but I think you I think and some of that stuff's in my family, you know. I've got like weird genes that have, you know anger disorders and all kinds of stuff. So I think there's real stuff there mm -hmm. that comes out in the music and the writing and, and um, you know, I always loved like James McMurtry is one of my favorite songwriters, but it's grim. I mean, like that stuff. And uh, I mean, at least I smile and stuff. <laughs> <in my show. laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to portray you as just a big angry stick standing up there, but for a song like Shimmer, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, yeah. Shimmer, which you've recorded a number of times, uh, and it's a great song. Uh, you had a choice. Uh, the choice. The song is really positive and happy most of the, most of the way through, and you get to the lines, you know, born to live, born to love, born to radiate. Uh, I think I may be missing the messing the lyrics up a little, but then you know, in, you could have continued in that vein, you know, born to shine, born to you know, smile and born to meditate. But instead you ended that with, we'll teach him how to hate, which takes the song completely 90 degrees, you know, and it turns it into- I don't into, do it that way. I don't no? do it that way. Not anymore. I noticed in the last version, you changed those lyrics. I changed that lyric to, let's let's not teach him how to hate or let's don't teach him how to hate. I, I uh, that's one of those things that I've realized about that song that, exactly what you said and that's you know that's something that a songwriter has to deal with when you write something and I wrote that in 1995 somewhere around then maybe 94 even but I think it was 1995 um yeah I mean I wasn't as good of a writer I mean I think that's as simple as it can be put it it, it wasn't as good of, it wasn't as well written so the longer I did that, that particular line bugged me. And finally, I figured out that I could just change a couple of words and, man, let's don't teach, you know, let's don't teach him how to hate, you know, that works so much better. And uh, so that's just something I've learned, you know, it's one of many, many things about songwriting that it's okay to change lines. Uh, Jimmy Webb does that even. I mean, over the years, he'll change stuff in his songs that people will come up to him after the show and, and say, you sang it this way, it doesn't go that way. And they'll say, <laughs> well, it goes that way now, you know. And 